24 May, on the island of Okinawa, a convoy is traveling to a practice area called Bolo Point to fire the Little John rocket. At the site, members of the battery prepare for the launching. A portable weather vane provides wind data. Final adjustments are made to fire the rocket out over the Pacific. A battery sergeant completes the final sighting, and the rocket is set on its way. In Grafenwehr, Germany, men of the 64th Armored Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division, take on ammunition during their annual firing at the Grafenwehr training area. With the required quotas of 105 millimeter shells and machine gun ammo aboard, the M60 tank moves away from the supply point and out onto the range. Spotters are at their scopes as the M60 fires its 105 millimeter gun from the first position. As other crews await their turn, machine guns are fired at a target moving across the range. When the firing ends, maintenance is performed to bring a long and successful day to a close. While the tanks are firing, Honest John rocket crews train with their equipment under simulated battle conditions. In preparation for an actual firing, a warhead is brought alongside the Honest John and mated to the rocket. This is delicate work which requires continuous training of the crew. Finally, it is completed. The Honest John is moved out from its concealment. It is elevated and adjusted to place it on target. Then the rocket is fired, completing the training exercise. A number of DeLong floating pier barges are being constructed by Japanese contractors at shipyards in Japan. These particular barges are being built on shipways. They are constructed so they may be floated into positions where needed for dock facilities, permanent or temporary. This Type A barge requires 10 steel tube caissons for its 300 foot length. The 150 foot Type B requires only six caissons. This DeLong barge inspector has just looked at a watertight compartment. DeLong representatives inspect each pier barge before it leaves the shipyard. Here, a Type B barge is towed by a seagoing tug toward its destination. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Beecher. I'm the commanding officer of the 538th Engineer Construction Battalion. We're located at Camp S.A. Owens, Thailand. Our base camp is located uh, approximately 45 kilometers south of Karat. In addition to building our camp after we arrived, uh, we built a tank farm, 90,000 barrel installation in the Karat area. Our primary mission is the construction of the 140 kilometer extension to the Bangkok Bypass Road. Shown here on our map in red, it extends from Kabinbury to Karat. Here's our location, Camp Essayon, 45 kilometers south of Karat. The extension road will complete the major link in the landline of communication with the port under development at Sadaheep of the Chachin South to Benbury Bangkok Bypass Road constructed over this past four year period by the 809th Engineer Battalion. The road will be constructed in two phases. 
Phase one is the construction of a military road. That is, a road capable of carrying military traffic as soon as possible. Phase two is the improvement of this road to the standards of the civilian highway. This project uh, is underway at the present time, it is approximately 40% complete, and the military road phase of the project is anticipated completion date, November 1966. During this training exercise in the Bangkok area, emphasis is being placed on communication. Since no radios are carried on the barges, signal men using a modified code must maintain contact between the vessels. People of all countries watch our elections. Candidates, parties, issues, these have far-reaching effects all over the world. Every election is a demonstration of freedom in action, proof that our democracy is of, for, and by the people. To people who do not have a free ballot, our use of the right to vote will point the way. The Armed Forces provides you the opportunity to vote. Study the issues, the candidates, and make your choice. See your voting officer. Get your registration and voting information. Send for your ballots. Above all, remember, vote. In Bangkok, the first transportation barge company of the Royal Thai Army assembles for training. Observing are Major Donald P. Malak, U.S. advisor, and the transportation group commander of the Royal Thai Army. The company of 200 men has 34 barges, which were constructed locally with United States funds. The vessels are single-engine, 48-foot craft, and 75-footers with twin screws. The unit receives help under the military aid program, but maintenance of the barges is at Royal Thai Army expense. The company is capable of operations up to a distance of 160 kilometers. The barges can meet ocean-going vessels in the lower river and take on cargo for movement directly up country. Since central Thailand is served by a system of rivers and canals, water transportation has great importance. Many sections of the country are reached primarily by water, and this barge company can land troops and supplies in these otherwise inaccessible areas. During this training exercise in the Bangkok area, emphasis is being placed on communication. Since no radios are carried on the barges, signal men using a modified code must maintain contact between the vessels. Well-trained and competent, the first Royal Transportation Barge Company represents the modern adaptation of an historic means of transportation in this land where waterways are a major key to successful military operations. At Panmunjom, 26 May, the Communist Honor Guard goose steps in preparation for the arrival of Commissar Pak Chung-guk, the chief representative of North Korea. The show is partially for North Korean guided tours visiting the area. Inside, the familiar accusations of neutral zone violations resume. A chart indicates the location of the alleged capture of U.S. weapons. The weapons are displayed outside for South Korean reporters. Many are communist-made, plus a few old U.S. items. Communist agitators attended in unusual numbers.
when the U.S. 627th Supply and Services Battalion moved into the fairgrounds in Santa Domingo last June, they found over 400 squatters. The problem of relocating them was given to U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Juan Ocasio of Puerto Rico. He transported some families back to their homes in the interior, but the others had nowhere to go. Ocasio found a vacant Toro field nearby. He arranged to bring a few families at a time to this field. The battalion collected scrap lumber, crates, and other materials which were taken to the building site and distributed to the families there. Sergeant Ocasio followed the work closely. At first, any kind of shelter from the weather was erected, even houses of cardboard. The problem was to get some place to stay until a better shelter could be built. Ocasio spent evenings and weekends planning streets and marking off building lots. Foundations for better houses were often started around the shacks themselves. A year after the project's start, shacks of all types continue to spring up in Ocasioville to meet the demand for immediate housing. Improvements are rapid as materials become available. As each shelter is completed, a family arrives to fill it. Simple as it may be, it is a real improvement over what they have known. Also, many of the people find employment in the battalion warehouses. The more ambitious, with extra effort, are able to make pleasant surroundings from their limited resources. Food provided by care and other sources is handled by soldiers who volunteer their free time to do the job. They break down large bags of cornmeal and flour to individual portions in paper sacks. Officers lending a hand include this army chaplain. Sergeant Ocasio passes out candy to the children. Sergeant Ocasio says, it is hard to believe that from 123 families, the town has grown to 279 homes. I don't know where they all come from. I spend most of my free time working with these people. I want to leave here knowing that they will have some of the common comforts needed for a happier life. Twelve thousand feet up in the Andes, lies Bolivia's four-century-old capital, La Paz. In May, a badly needed bridge is being constructed through a municipal community action program known as Acción Communal. Advisors are a U.S. specialist from a Canal Zone Civil Affairs Detachment and Bolivian Army personnel. Up to 60% financing is furnished by Alliance for Progress. Eroding water runs across the road now. Assisted in preliminary engineering work by Bolivian soldiers, civilian workers have completed one side of the foundation of the two-lane bridge, and work continues on the remaining half. A community action official calls for weekend volunteers over a loudspeaker. Axion Communal is limited to La Paz and is engaged in 10 projects. It was begun in 1964, and all projects remain subject to the mayor's approval. It coordinates community councils in self-help programs such as hygiene, housing, and parks. The La Paz Rehabilitation Center receives volunteer assistance from American Army Wives. Established in 1960 for physically handicapped children, the center now includes children crippled by congenital deformities and polio. The therapy room has a whirlpool bath, flexing bar, mirrors and practice steps, and an electrotherapy machine. Vocational training includes weaving and carpentry. The brace shop with equipment given by the World Rehabilitation Fund is run by one man trained in Mexico. 
A monthly community party is given by U.S. Army wife volunteers. Present is the center's founder and the brace maker, himself a victim of a crippling disease. Along with parties such as these, wives stage sales to raise funds, in addition to money contributed directly, and temporarily adopt some abandoned children to give them extra care. With the help of U.S. military group personnel, the center has placed a number of its children in American homes. Here, a six-year-old child leaves his last community party and heads for the airport to start a new life in faraway Santa Monica, California. After the ceremonies, Mickey Mantle takes over. He plouts two king-sized home runs. President Eisenhower gets a big kick out of their distance. And the Yankees wallop Washington in their opener 10-4. Your Congress has enacted a law to assist you to vote. The law provides that you may vote by absentee ballot in almost all states. The federal voting law applies to all members of the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, their families, dependents, and in fact, all qualified civilians abroad. The law, however, does not guarantee your right to vote unless you qualify under the laws of your own state. See your voting officer today. He will help you qualify. Remember, you can't vote without a ballot, and you can't get a ballot unless you send for it. Vote. For the baseball fan, winter is forgotten when the season opens. It's official when the president throws out the first ball. An old sandlot outfielder does it before nearly 28,000 in Washington. The players scramble and Gil McDougall of the Yankees gets it. After the ceremonies, Mickey Mantle takes over. He clouts two king-sized home runs. President Eisenhower gets a big kick out of their distance. And the Yankees wallop Washington in their opener 10-4. Boston's Red Sox are the early choice as the Yankees' American League pennant rivals and nearly 32,500 in Fenway Park see Governor Herter of Massachusetts perform the ancient rite. The Red Sox get away against Baltimore and win just as easily as the Yanks. Ted Williams polls three left field hits in an 8-1 victory. The big show in the National League is at Ebbets Field in Brooklyn. First, a mammoth parade of loyal Brook fans. Who ever heard of disloyal ones? Inside, 25,000 gather to see the world champs face the Phillies. Oh, happy Brooklyn days. That's D-A-Z-E. Cursing the first world championship flag in Flatbush history. And manager Walter Alston gets a big kick out of it. Johnny Padres, the Brooks World Series hero, is now in the Navy, but he's around for the big day and shows Roy Campanella how a gob wears his top piece. More than half an hour late, due to all the celebrations, the Brooks go out to battle and the fans roar. It's a great day for the Dodgers, except for one little detail. They forget to win the game. A three-run homer by Jimmy Greengrass routes Big Don Newcomb. Robin Roberts manages to thwart the Brooks and the Phillies spoil the party by winning 8-6. One home opener is enough for most clubs, but two days later it's over and under the rivers to Jersey to do it all over again. The Dodgers are playing part of their home schedule in Jersey City. Fails to hop up the attendance. Only about 12,000, half of capacity, come out for the show. But the parading goes on just like the Army. Mayor Bernard Berry of Jersey City in form. It's a strike to Campy. It looks like another bad day for the Dodgers, but they finally win in the 10th, 5-4.
Yankee Stadium stages the first big series of the season. The Red Sox come to grips with the American League champions. 35,000 at the final game. Joe Collins of the Yanks up in the second inning with a man on against Frank Sullivan. Joe lines one deep to right. Jackie Jensen leaps but misses, and it just clears the wall for a homer. It scores Bill Scarron ahead, and the Yanks, after winning the first two games, lead again. More trouble for the Sox in the fourth. Jerry Lumpy's grounder is booted by Billy Klaus with two on. Klaus fails to nip Scarron off third, and the bases are full with pitcher Don Larson up. Sullivan fires. And there it goes, a big drive over the fence in right center for a grand slam. That's four more runs to make it six to one for the Yankees. Fifth inning, Jimmy Pearsall sends a blast roaring over Hank Bauer's head in left for two bases as the Sox start to fight back. After a walk to Budden, Ted Williams pinch hits against Larson. Ted comes through with a hit up the middle. It sends Pearsall scampering home as the Sox rally for three runs. Seventh inning, Lumpy's throw pulls Scarlett off first base and the sacks are loaded because it follows a hit and an error. The Sox finally tie the score. On Goodman's grounder to carry, Budden hustles for home and just makes it. Yogi Berra chases him, but umpire Hurley rules he did touch the plate. Back come the Yanks in their half against Frank Baum and Boston bonus baby. Mickey Mantle cracks the tie with a fierce double to right center that hits the wall on the first bounce, sending Bauer and McDougal home. Casey Stengel is jumping. And Vera delivers another home run. The Yankees wallop the Red Sox 13 to 6 to make a clean sweep of the first big series. Fighting Sons of the Navy, lusty offspring of officers at Annapolis weigh in for the annual kids boxing tournament at the Naval Academy. Phantom battlers ready for action. Youngsters from five years old and up learning the fundamentals of give and take in an event founded by famous Navy boxing coach Spike Webb, now retired. Clear the decks for a couple of the Mosquito Fleet class. Look at that spry youngster. He may not throw much leather, but his footwork is terrific. Second bout coming up. This destroyer moves in fast, runs into a torpedo, but gets right back into the fray. Another pair of shipmates. Here's one with a plan of battle. He keeps his jab going to get in, and then lets go with his secret weapon. Another pair of pint-sized battle wagons sail in for a ready exchange with the big guns right on the target. That salvo was rugged as this one comes back to port. Father is there to help tighten up the seams. And back he goes. They never give up the ship in the Navy. Youngsters developing the will and courage to take it, no matter how rough the going. 